So we finally get to talk about hypothesis testing. The last little section that we are talking about here is, of course, with a mean, but this time, what happens if you don't know sigma? Now, I want to remind you that if you did know sigma, what type of test would you use? A Z test. What happens if you don't know sigma? You're going to use a... Yeah, so it all comes down to, again, just like chapter 7, very, very similar uh, order of steps that we took here. First it was proportions, then it was mean knowing sigma, now it's mean not knowing sigma, Z, Z, T. Okay, so pretty much it's up to you to know the difference between a proportion and a mean. Proportions are Z's. Means you have two options. You have, you know sigma, Z, you don't know sigma, T. You got it? So same exact idea that we, we've been dealing with. Of course our requirements are pretty similar. Uh, we still need the requirement for a random sample. Of course that's going to almost go without saying, you have to have random samples, otherwise you bias your data. Requirement two is, it's weird to have a requirement, but your sigma shouldn't be known. If your, if your sigma was known, if your population standard deviation was known, you wouldn't even be doing this. You'd be in the last section. You'd be in section 8.4, right? Because you'd know sigma, all the requirements would be met. You'd be using a z-test statistic and a z-critical value. Here we go, okay, well, if we don't know our sigma, sigma stands for population standard deviation. So on your wording of your problems, instead of saying, population standard deviation is, it's going to say sample standard deviation is. Are you with me? You've got to have a standard deviation somewhere. You're going to have a standard deviation. It's just you have to read very carefully whether it says population standard deviation, i.e. a z-score, or sample standard deviation, what we're learning today. So sigma is not known. but S is. Lastly, what was that magic number again? N, N was the sample size has to be what now? Or? What is normally distributed? The population. That's right. So either your sample size is more than 30, in which case it will fit a standard normal curve, or a normal distribution, or your population has to be normally distributed because if you sample from that, you'll get another normal distribution when you consider your uh, central limit theorem. So n's more than 30, or the population is normal. If these are the cases, if we if we don't know sigma, but we do know s and everything else is the same as last section, then we're not going to have a Z test statistic anymore. Our test statistic is going to be a T. Now, fortunately for us, we've already calculated this. We should know how to do it. It's not too bad. It looks very similar to our Z test statistic. It still has X bar. And what's X bar stand for again? So me. Okay, good, because we're still basing our evidence and trying or getting our claim on our evidence compared to our population guess, pretty much, with our, our null hypothesis. So it's our, our evidence. We subtract the actual claim from it, what we're trying to state about our population mean. And we're seeing if this is rare enough to, to avoid our null hypothesis, basically. Now, down here, what, what goes here? Yeah, standard deviation. Typically, it would be sigma for a z-score, right? But we don't have a z-test statistic here. We have a t. So we're not going to know sigma, so we got to use the, the different limit of s. And here's the same thing, square root of n. The steps are literally identical to section 8.3 and 8.4. You're going to do the same seven steps. First, you're going to come to your claim then your null and your alternative, then your significance level, then your test statistic. After that though, we only have one option. You're not going to be using the p-value method here, which is why I taught you the traditional method to begin with. Because in a, in a t-value, or a t-test statistic test, it's really hard to find out the, the p-value. Right? You need a calculator to do it. You can approximate with your table, but if you look at your table, your table only works one way. Your table only works on giving you the area or the, the critical values based on the amount of significance in each tail. Have you noticed that? It only works one way. It's not like a z-score that works both ways. So your calculator would do it. Your calculator would do it. 
Uh, and I could show you that if, if you'd like to learn it. But since everyone doesn't have a graphic calculator, I can't make you learn a p-value test because you wouldn't even be able to do it for half of you. You follow? Since it's not a requirement for this course, I'm not going to teach you the p-value method. I'm going to teach you the traditional method for solving this with a t-test statistic. Do you understand? Okay, so there's only the traditional method for us. method only. Let's do this with an example, we'll work our way through all seven steps, figure out if we can apply the last information to this section. <coughs> so let's say that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that you're, you're in the, the business of bottling soda. Now of course, we want to make sure that how, much, how many ounces are in a can of soda typically? 12. About 12 ounces, that's right. Now are you going to be exactly at 12 ounces every time you make a soda? Ah, you'd be a little less, a little more. But you want to be really, really close to 12, right? So let's say that you're, you're on the line and you're in, in charge of quality control. And so these quality control people, they typically will take a sample. They're not going to check every soda. You can't do that. But they'll, they'll pull off a couple hundred sodas, open them up, and, and sneeze right in and put it back. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, they'll, they'll open them all up, they'll dump them out, and they'll figure out how much soda was in each can. It should be right about 12 ounces. True? You don't want too little, you don't want too, too much. So this guy has collected all these sodas, he's dumped them out, and he's found out that the average level of soda is right around 12.11 ounces. That's more than they should have, right? So he's going to go and say, well, let's see. I want to test this claim to see whether or not we're actually giving away too much soda consistently. Now, of course, that sample had too much soda in it on average, right? But he needs to be sure enough. It needs to be significantly more for him to say, hey, we need to, we need to recheck our production. Because it could have been this. It could have been that the, how much did he have to say, he pulled off 39 sodas. It could be that the 39 sodas he pulled off just happened to be the ones that were a little bit fuller every single time. You with me? That's going to happen. That's going to be the random chance. That's why that the sample, there's some randomness to that. It's not every soda he's considering. So we need to find out, is his sample significantly different enough from the 12 ounces to state with, with a certain measure of certainty that we are producing cans with too much soda in it. You guys understand the idea here? So is it producing too much soda? Well, for those 39 cans, yes. But is that significantly different enough to say that it's for everything to a certain level of significance? In our case, it would be 0.01. So let's, let's try to go ahead and, and do this problem. So you're in the soda business. You sample 39 cans of soda. The mean volume of soda was 12.11 ounces. With a sample standard deviation of 0.27 ounces. What I want to do is test this guy's claim. Because this guy said, well, wait a second. I know that this is more than what we should have, 12 ounces. So I'm going to test the claim that we are producing too much soda. So test the claim that the mean level of soda, mean volume of soda, is more than 12 ounces, what the, the volume it should be in a can.
Firstly, does the wording look familiar? It should look a lot like the, your homework looked. It's going to read exactly like a test problem is going to read. This is going to be a test problem or something really, really similar, worded exactly the same way. So we have a sample of a certain number of things. You have a mean of whatever it is with a standard sample standard deviation of something, and then it's going to say test the claim that, and it's going to give you some uh, population parameter that, that you're going to test here based on some evidence that you collected. First, I want to go back just a little bit. Do you understand that, that we've actually done the work necessary to collect a sample like this? If I gave you 39 cans and said, here's the level of, of, the, of the soda in there, 12.0, 12.05, 11.99, and I gave you 39 of those, would you be able to calculate the mean? Yeah, you could actually do that, right? Would you be able to calculate standard deviation? Sure, you plug in your calculator, you could do that, plus I gave you formulas. So you have the ability to find this, where well, you can count, this, where well, you can do the mean, and this, where well, you can do the standard deviation. You have the ability to actually do that. Now, we don't do it because it takes a long time to do that stuff, right? That was in your first test. But you could, you could actually do that. Next up, I want to refresh your memory on significance level. Our significance level is 0.01 here. So when we're talking about a 0.01 significance level, it's saying we're a certain amount, uh, we have, a, we have a, a, a level of certainty about our result here. How certain are we going to be when we're done with this that we're correct? 99% certain, that's right. If I, if I made that 0.05, we'd only be 95% certain. You guys okay with that one? All right. By the way, if I have a 0 0.02, how certain am I going to be? 98%. Yeah, we can also use that one on the t-test. T it's pretty easy to find that one. It's one, of our, it's one of our columns. Okay. Now, in order to do our problem, we have to get this categorized correctly. So, first thing we do is identify whether we're talking about a proportion or a mean. Which are we talking about here? Clearly a mean. I'm even in the correct section for means. But I want you to really read through that and understand it. So it says nothing about proportion. Uh, we see here we're, we're talking about means, mean volume, test the claim that the mean, that's really where we're getting it is what our claim says. Not, it's not about proportion. It's not saying most or, more, or, or, or something like that. That would be proportion words. This says that the mean. So we're, we're definitely talking about mu here. It's a, it's a population mean. Next thing in, within our means, we've got to categorize whether we're talking about a z-test statistic or a t-test statistic, and that's based on one thing and one thing only, whether or not you know the population standard deviation. Now, I've got to tell you, you're always going to have at least some standard deviation. It has to give it to you, otherwise this you can't do, right? It, a standard deviation goes there. You're going to have one of them. You just have to say whether you have a population or a sample standard deviation. It'll just say explicitly on your paper, either population or, or assume population standard deviation is or population standard deviation is this if it says anything else if it says you have a sample with a mean of this and a and a standard deviation of it's implied that that sample standard deviation is what that number is right here I, I'm going to say it even more explicitly for you with a sample standard deviation of this do we know sigma or do we know s, s. We know s because it said sample standard deviation that, that's the key thing that's going to happen on your test because, of course, I'm not going to say this problem is from 8.4, this problem is from 8.5, and that way you know. You actually have to read it and, and understand what these things are saying. So sample standard deviation says we don't even know sigma, we know 